Welcome to a mini episode of the Cosmic Tape Music Club podcast. Today we're doing an interview with Kirk from Dogbotic. So very excited. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So we have started this series. We've been doing episodes about, you know, mostly people who are no longer with us, who, you know, kind of invented the things that we're exploring now and experimenting with. But we have so many people who are starting to work in this space or experiment with things um, in the tape music space that we thought it would be really fun to do some interviews with, you know, some living people. So thank you for joining us. If you could just, you know, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Dogbotic. Yeah, you bet. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, my name's Kirk Pearson. Uh, I use they, them pronouns. I'm originally from uh, New York, uh, New York City. Uh, where I, I was kind of, you know, I, I grew up in the American folk music tradition and then, you know, became an orchestral cellist for some time. I later went to school to study music composition. And now I'm here in Berkeley, California, where I run a weird little company called Dogbotic, where effectively what I do is uh, I make strange and interesting sounds for strange and interesting people. Um, and so I've been running this uh, studio for quite some time where a lot of the work we do is stuff like film scoring or sound design or installation art and stuff like that, that all uses generally weird studio techniques. So oftentimes companies, you know, they're coming out with an app or something like that, like they hire us. So we come up with interesting sounds that are memorable and unique for them, uh, which is a really fun job. And, you know, I have the attention span of a goldfish, right? So it's, <laughs> uh, so it's really fun for me to make every job unique. And so every job I try to use a new technique that I'm unfamiliar with or, you know, actually go out to record sounds that I have not been near before. And, you know, it, it, it helps make the jobs feel much more real and practical. And I think, you know, a lot more fun uh, from the client end as well. Anyway, so that was all going fine and dandy for many years. And then March 2020 comes around and all of those gigs that uh, yep. <laughs> I was super excited about. I was like, yeah, 2020 is going to be our year. Yes, and, uh, we were saying that too. Exactly. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So we were all very disappointed, right? And so like uh, <laughs> work, uh, work got very quiet for a couple months. And then I started working with a uh, with a, a partner organization in Oakland called Thingamajigs, which they do wonderful uh, like music outreach and education stuff. And uh, they have a performance group. And uh, I developed this uh, build your own synthesizers workshop that I started teaching with them. So it would be like, I would send you a giant box of stuff. It's a couple months long. And then we learn how to build a synthesizer a part at a time while, while you're at home. I think uh, like electronic music tinkering has always been a lot of fun for me for a variety of reasons. Like one is, um, uh, well, first of all, it's like when you work in the DAW all the time, like I'm sure, I'm sure yes. you guys can identify with this, but when you work in the DAW all the time, every DAW meaning, you know, digital audio workstation, right? Your logic, your pro tools, et cetera. Everything is tweakable and touchable and stuff, right? But nothing is tactile. You're not really putting your hands on something and expressing yourself through it. Um, and so right. that's what led me to, you know, doing to do all of these things. So I think this stuff is really fun. It's not that hard to learn. Uh, and it also demystifies just a lot of how the world works. Like, I think, you know, a world in which people think their technology is magic, like is a dangerous world, right? Like when you think your technology is magic, that's when people start burning down cell phone towers because they think they're spreading COVID. Or like, <laughs> right. You know, are really yeah. surprised when misinformation spreads on Facebook or something, right? Like, like yeah, your computer isn't magic. If Amazon could call their Alexa a magic device, like they <laughs> certainly would be calling it that because the more you don't understand about it means the more you're going to think it's a magical device and buy a lot of them, right? But, you know, teaching- Wait, 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 wait. Alexa is not magic? <laughs> Alexa is not magic, unfortunately. No? But we actually, we take one apart in a, an Alexa device oh, uh, at the end okay. of the synth class simply as a means to show you how the design of a lot of modern electronics is done in such a way where you can't fix it. Like it's very intentional. You're not supposed to be able to fix it. You're supposed to throw it out and buy a new one, right? Um, and so it's interesting to have that counterpoint in the workshop after you've been working with like discrete parts for so long, because you realize just how dramatically in the last 20 years, the way we design products has been totally shifted to be from something that satisfies the consumer's needs more or less to something that satisfies the company's needs. But anyway, I'm getting I'm getting outside of the point. Uh, I mean, you're not supposed to just remove that burnt capacitor with the tip of your soldering iron and put in a new one. 
Well, yeah, I mean, like the, the parts that are used today are really small. They're intended for machines to put it together. And also, you know, they're, you know, they're made so cheaply that they're not really intended for you to be able to pull out that one capacitor and put a new one in like you could in the past, you know. So, you know, not, not, not to sound like, a, you know, a crotchety older person or anything like that, but I think those messages are really important, like uh, convincing people that A, you know, uh, the Moogs and the Korgs and the teenage engineerings of the world are not the arbiters of new sounds. Like you have the ability to make that stuff just as well as they can. And, uh, and you know, it's something unique that only you have. And two, the, the skills that you're learning are really the fundamental skills behind how everything works. And the more that, you know, people are convinced that, you know, their toaster works for, you know, similar reasons to their computer, you know, I think, you know, I think that's actually a social good. So what we're interested in here in the in the Cosmic Tape Music Club is how tape comes into the picture. And uh, tell us a little bit about the the tape workshop that you guys offer at Dogbotic. Yeah, well, thank you for bringing that up. So we've been doing this workshop um, since January. Uh, it's a really ridiculous one, but we call it cassette hacking. So you get a giant box in the post and... Uh, yeah, because there's our there's our lovely graphic. Love it. Um, so the workshop. I love the artwork, by the way. Like, did oh, yeah. you work? Did you guys work with a um, an artist that you guys know, or did you hire somebody? Like, or how did that relationship happen? Who are you working with? Yeah. So uh, um, an advantage of being a, a production studio. So like a lot of our clients are animators. So we work with a ton of illustrators from everywhere around the world. Uh, this particular illustrator is Maisie Byerly, who's actually, she's a good friend of mine. We went to college together, but her art just has this amazing sense of humor to it. And that was really important for me when I put the workshops together, because I think especially electronics, like it really, it's a really toxic world. It's really masculine. It's really, you know, it's it, like learning electronics on your own sucks. It's really <laughs> awful. Like you can go on Reddit and ask questions and the Reddit people will be all mean to you and shame you for not knowing something that like, why would you be expected to know it? And so like, I really wanted to make it clear that like, that's not what we're about. And I think the illustrations communicate that pretty quickly that, you know, like- I think so, can't... I agree. You're talking to folks that do like those little eighties style electronic kits, like where it's like 200 experiments in one. Like we literally do one of those experiments every Sunday. Like really, I I get such incredible joy from seeing students take these workshops and then make things that are so much cooler than anything I ever made. And really, like all we do is just kind of push them in a direction. We don't really do too much. Also, speaking of that, I just kind of like this. We designed this '80s Radio Shack style fake catalog. That's our political manifesto, but it has I love it. You believe a workshop should be. But nevertheless, so the tape workshop, it's yeah. So you oh, get all yeah. of this stuff, and we effectively we teach you how to take a, a consumer Walkman, we give you a couple in the kit, and we teach you how to uh, rip it apart and then how to circuit bend it. So how you can do weird uh, cosmetic surgery on the circuit on the inside to get it to make all sorts of crazy sounds that the manufacturer never intended. So um, so we start out by doing really basic things by essentially just building circuits that siphon energy out of the motor so you can make it play back at any speed you want. And then we really kind of quickly amp it up from there to the point where by the end you're making Vactrols that can do AM synthesis on your Walkman. You're built, you build your own sequencer on the second day of the workshop that lets you compose melodies and play them back on your cassette player. Like it, it's wow. really cool. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of good practical stuff in there, and it's intended for complete beginners. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say that's for anyone, right? Like. It sounds yes. really intimidating, but you're going to walk everybody through it day <laughs> we one. Do. We have a very close to 100% success rate. Um, we, we've we had 16-year-olds take the workshop, and they've been totally fine. Like, what I really think is amazing about this stuff is how accessible a lot of it is. Like, mm -hmm. I really think if you have the right person walk you through the process, you can start building really impressive things really quickly. It's just there's so much black boxing in the electronics world that I don't really think is helpful to anyone. It just makes the electronics people feel like it's their own special club and that no one else can join in. But like, no, this stuff is accessible. This stuff is a folk art. This stuff is something yeah. that anyone can do. So true. So um, we actually had this uh, experience where we went to a make i think magazine when they were still in business yeah. mm -hmm. hosted a electronics workshop in maryland where which was close to where we were living at the time in dc and i think that was your first soldering experience i mean that can't be true but maybe in Is like it? a public setting in a public setting right like where 
you know, anyone from the age five to 99 plus. They had a little soldering was, workshop was is my this. point. Yeah. And uh-huh. it was really cool to, you know, get to engage in that and, you know, mess around with soldering in, in real time. And in yeah, we life. made a little pin that lit up. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. There was, like, there was like a little wearable. I noticed you guys mentioned wearables on your website as a service that you provide. <laughs> yeah, potentially. I did a weird project a couple of years ago with a dance company that involved a couple of wearables. It's oh, not okay. it's not a regular service that people call up for, but you know, hey, if you got a wearable electronics project, I'm I think wearables are super cool. But if it's yeah. not for those kind of experiences, you know, people may not obtain their first. You know, like they may not pop and their soldering yeah. cherry, so to speak. <laughs> soldering is one of those things that's like it's not that hard to learn and it's really empowering to learn. Like, I think it's mm-hmm. really cool. Like as soon as people learn to solder, there's kind of like this, you, you see like these synapses fire and they go, Oh my gosh, now I can do all of this. And it is really true. Like once you know how an integrated circuit is numbered, how to read a schematic and how to mm-hmm. solder. Like, yeah. That's kind of when it just starts becoming like a paint by numbers thing and electronics can really become whatever you want of it. Have um, you seen anyone who, takes one of your workshops and like wasn't an enthusiast and now is like are you changing people's lives and (laughs) sucking them into this black hole that we're all in (laughs) well i mean i I certainly hope so we do actually see a lot on our on our feedback forms a lot of people refer to it as life changing which i think is like i'm not very flattered by that but um you know i I don't know if that's really true but it's very nice of them to say so i think um i i think what we're able to do and you know it's well, first of all, like it's been a really long, lonely year, right? So it's just lovely to be in a, <laughs> in conversation with other people that love the things that you do. So like the workshops do provide this really nice social thing for people. But I also think like, uh, especially with tape, it's uh, it's such an interesting topic. And it's one that we can really take in a lot of dimensions to the point where there's something brand new for everybody. So like we don't only talk about like the physics of like how electromagnetism works, although like we have to cover that because that's <laughs> essential but we also talk about things like how the design of the compact cassette afforded all sorts of interesting political movements that came out of it like it would be really hard to smuggle in lps of like the shah of iran speaking right if you so you know um so yeah so certainly a lot of um the the compact cassette kind of let political figures disassociate their bodies from their ideologies in a weird way into a very smugglable item. It allowed people the ability to record stuff on their own. We would not have had a revolution in hip hop if it weren't for the compact set, which I know is weird. People think about vinyl records as being the right. But no, <laughs> I'm thinking about the the TV series Chernobyl. Actually, even when you mentioned that, well, what was in Chernobyl? Well, he he did it. The whole uh, narrative was a cassette recording. Totally right. Yeah, that the lead that. character was doing. Yeah, from the beginning. Like the gossip. Yeah, right. Yeah. I was that's thinking about problem. Hitler. Sorry, that's just. And, I, <laughs> ooh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, when you think about like po- politicians using tape to get their message out. I think of Nazis. Yeah. Like, I mean, <laughs> that's a big one, right? Well, yeah. Then the Nazis were the ones to develop the wire recorder and exactly. all, all of that. All but that. there is something like Robin Hood like about the cassette. Like, yeah. I guess. <laughs> there is. Um, likewise, I mean, home taping, right? Like you would not have home taping if we were still stuck with vinyl platters for everything. So yeah, we do talk a lot about design and about the affordances of design, because really, like, that's the thing that ushers in political change. It's the fact that now all of a sudden this new medium is something that is small, it's accessible, and you can deal with it from home. Plus, you can edit, right? You can't really edit an LP. You can't smash an LP. And well, most people don't think you can edit cassette. Oh, but... But they're wrong. They know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, it's it's really nice to do that. It's also like I, I gotta say, like as a professional composer, sound designer, like I am so glad I don't live in the tape era. Like, <laughs> I mean, I am like I, of course I grew up with compact cassettes and stuff like that. But like, nice to have an alternative. It's so nice to have an alternative, and I think that actually that makes better a lot alternative of yeah. for a lot of people is mm-hmm. understanding that now, like when you compose with tape in 2021, it's not at all like composing with tape was in 1960. Now you can use tape as part of your process, so you can get everything that's so interesting and organic about working with analog tape, but you don't have to worry about editing on analog tape. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, or you can make the most impossible seeming edits in digital with tape sounds. 
This is true. And I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's fine. I'm not one of those originalists that's like everything must be on paper. It doesn't, you know, like it's, uh, you know, really, I think it's, I think it's most liberating to people that we just show them a couple ways you can make it part of your process. Um, and, you know, and, and, and I think that's nice. It means a lot of people are now working with new textures and new techniques, really, like the process of building something with tape is different. And I think playing around with process is like, that's how we all become better composers, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And definitely just like having a new relationship with sound. Totally. I think is, you know, breaking it down to the fundamentals in a way that actually is like tactile, you know, can, for me as the, like the way that I learn, that's, that's so helpful especially a new concept. So, you know, for me, I get excited about how sound interacts with tape and then how we interact with tape. And to have this opportunity where people are physically getting these kits mm -hmm. and then doing the virtual, right? It's virtual, the workshop, right? So that we're getting the physical kit and then we're getting online and, and meeting with everyone and going through this. Like that to me is like the perfect blend of, you know, what excites me about the past as well as, you know, where we're at right now. You know, tape was a creative medium for sound creation for a lot of people for a long time. And yeah. then it sort of it just like went away, right? Stopped. Yeah. And I even, you know, I mean, I'm I'm a little bit older uh, in terms of like a lot of the people that I interact with. And I grew up, you know, from like the late 70s, to the early 80s, you know, like using, I guess, appreciating that myself as an era of creative sound production you know where mm, tape was like yes kind of your only option you know if yeah. you wanted to do it at home you know throughout my childhood you had to have a four track you know you had to have a tape solution you know there wasn't the, the digital audio workstations well, the ways exist. that you played with sound and music because of that is so different than you know someone who's growing up now obviously we have this community and it's this mix of older people who can't believe that we're talking about tape right. and younger people who are like, Oh, this tape thing is cool. I've only had dog. I've only right. seen it in my father's like this console, you know, central console of his car. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, yeah. Totally. It's, it is really cool to look at, like to meet a lot of 16 year olds that have actually never played a compact cassette before. And we are the first time they've had access to a compact cassette. So hard to believe. But, like even yeah. just the sensation of like poking the motor when you open mm. the rack, you realize that when you stop the motor, you hear the pitch of your recording going near and stop mm. the nothing. Like you can actually poke it and touch it and it will respond to you in real time. Like it, it really is like you're playing an instrument, you know, unlike playing with a da, which is, you know, much, you know. It can seem magical, person. right? Yeah. I love that you brought that up. I'm, I'm yeah. getting like re-excited about like, the fact that we're bringing tape back for like a new generation. Yeah. Got me so excited I, 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 again. Which actually brings an interview question for me. <laughs> um, do you, I'm going to go ahead and say this, but do you feel like we are on the verge of a tape music era, similar to the modular synthesis era that we are currently in? That's a really wonderful question. So I think modular synthesizers are interesting in that like uh, five years ago or something like that, they were still a hobby of the multimillionaires and suddenly magically within the last five years, like, I mean, they're still very expensive, <laughs> don't get me wrong, but just the, the amount of enthusiasm that came out of nowhere for, I am, I'm astonished by that. And so I, I really yeah. hope that happens with tape as well. I kind of, um, and I'm, I'm, I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to put all my eggs in that basket just yet, but I do think we're definitely heading into an era where it seems like uh, the novelty of working with the DAW is definitely wearing off for a lot of people. And, you know, people do want something that's much more touchable and tangible and a thing that they make themselves, right? Like, I mean, I, yeah, I use DAW presets all the time, sure. But like, as soon as you hear someone else use them, you realize that, you know, you're, you're dealing with the same musical real estate, right? And so uh, I, I think, you know, just like this, the quick lesson that like, without too much elbow grease, you can get something like this working and actually make a sound that legitimately nobody else has ever made. That's really exciting to a lot of people. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. What led you, like you said, you're a composer, you're doing these, you know, commissioned works. How, yeah. how does tape come into this for you? Like, what's your tape story? That's a great oh, that's, <laughs> well, I grew up, I mean, I grew up listening to cassette tapes. Like that was, that was the, year. I grew, I'm, I was born in 94. So right, right at the end of the tape era, I actually think like the biggest political difference between me and the people that were born five years ahead of me, um, is not so much the, like they had the internet and I didn't when I was born, but it's much more, I remember a world where there was analog physical media mm -hmm. and they don't. And I think there, there, therein lies a really big psychological difference just about how I tend to think about this stuff and work with it wow. five, five years younger. Yeah, not that saying that they're wrong or anything. It's just yeah, like, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Right. There was quite a transition, yeah. Yeah, right at that point. It took place, that was a crux, yeah. Absolutely, and I mean like, yeah, like I, I really think that like, that can't be understated. Like I know there's a lot of people that go on and on about how vinyl sounds better than digital. And to be totally honest, I don't know whether it sounds any better than digital. But what I can tell you is, listening to a vinyl record is an ultimately different experience than listening to an album on Spotify. You have to yes. pick out the thing. You have to look at the art. You probably listen through the entire side because it doesn't afford easy skipping around. Whereas on Spotify, if I'm not entertained in 20 seconds, done. You know, right. right. And so it depends it, on it, how yeah. it aged. Every item a ages differently and, you know, s is subjected to different circumstances and might have a different, you know, tonal quality completely. Mm. Sure, totally. But also just like, like actually, literally, physically, how it engages you is different. Yes. The fact that you have yes. to touch something and deal with it and fast forward to get to another track and it's really inconvenient. All of that changes how you listen to your cassette. And so, you know, that that's just kind of an interesting exercise that I honestly really forgot about until I started playing with cassettes again about a, a year or two ago. Yeah. 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 There is definitely a physical difference there. And I tend to appreciate that time of rewinding and fast forwarding and, you know, the time in between, you know, like I, I feel like that's time that I've gotten back somehow. Ooh, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm like, wow, I get to think now while I'm rewinding this tape. And mm. normally this would be an, in an instant yeah. event, you know? And so that I, part of things, that's really cool. Yeah. And so whatever I'm thinking about right now is free time, you know, wow. like, which is important time too. It's not lost sure. productivity, right? Don't think it's not. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have that's to be. That's quality right. analytical time you got right there. I Absolutely. Totally that wow, that's one of the biggest selling points for tape that I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes you think. Yeah. Well, yeah, it just reminds me of like that anything that helps you slow down, I think is helpful right now in our culture. So maybe that's part of the subconscious layer of what attracts me to the tape versus when we work in the DAW, we're making music in that way. Do you like tape, Jacqueline? I think I do. <laughs> it's like you said, you know, you can do so much so fast, you know, you can get the result, you can test your idea out even, you know, so that still has a place and a value. And mm -hmm. I am also glad to be alive in a time when I can use that along with the other things. But I think that's, again, why it's just interesting to be in this specific moment. Yes, we have, you know, the pandemic going on and it's changed our lives, but I think we'd be here with tape and, you know, these packing things anyway, just because like you said, we've reached this point of saturation and sort of like, okay, I know like there's not a novelty, right. With using Ableton anymore. I do love Ableton. I don't mean to. Yeah, no, we do too. It's and I, I think know, it is our... the most like physical DAW. Like it's it's very much right. designed like an instrument, so you can think about it like an instrument. But you yeah, know. definitely, it's... it was definitely the marvel of two thousand one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most certainly. Um, right. Yeah, man, what a weird era for music technology that was. Like, I that was my it. era. Like, I was you're, you're I was an fine. early two thousands kid <laughs> for really yeah, discovering so you, most of my music technology. I had an Akai S three thousand XL and a uh, and a um, a Virus B by Axis is my like main two instruments when I was first getting into music production. I mean, so, that was the height of that. Yeah, era. like I said, I'm a little bit older, you know, but like Not that much older. But yeah, right. you know, I try to. I got a bunch of like, uh, that was my jam back in 01. Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, there's this ridiculous, ridiculous company called electrics that made all of these, uh, oh, those were amazing. Uh, yeah. The vocoder, the filter bank and they like have the, 
the vocoder. Yeah. They, they, they sound. I'm pretty like sure they, Black Moss Super Rainbow uses that vocoder. Indeed. So and I'm a big fan of them. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's all it's all that one vocoder, which I have right down here. I think the. Uh, yeah, I yeah, don't have they, one. <laughs> yeah, they're they're really weird. They look disgusting. Like they're just they like, look <laughs> terrible. They look like the worst yeah. piece. They're the most dated piece of early two thousands <laughs> like music technology that ever existed. Oh, I feel yeah. like if you want to know what two thousand one through two thousand three looked like hardware wise, it looked like. Wait, a, you have? Can you lift it up? It looked like us? a Fetrix. Or is it yeah. too? It's integrated. I, I, this is tied to my computer, but it's yeah. funny. I'll send you a picture. It's okay. red. It has. It's the. It's, the it's red and gray. And green and gray and yeah. blue and gray. Terrible color choices. But, but awesome devices. Really the cool. looper was amazing. The, the oh, looper cool. was amazing. Like yeah, everything really they made was cool. great. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I have to add this to the show notes. We talked about it, Effectrix. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we got a we got a lot of those. I I, I love that stuff. I think that it, yeah, it was it was a bizarre era. A lot of the stuff sounds really dated from it, but I'm totally into that. I think it's really cool that you can take people back to 2002 just by throwing in something weird on this. Uh, that is making me realize that that's the next like resurgence we're gonna have, and I don't think I'm ready for it. Those <laughs> items are already going for a lot more than they should be on eBay. Yeah. Yikes. yeah. You, you, wait, wait, Jackie. You mean like the the outboard gear era is kind yeah. of. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think so. I hope so. It seems like guitar pedals are also making a reemergence in a. I in feel like it's it's been, it's too soon for that, but I are but I feel it already. As soon it's as like, people are clamoring the for the are... line six of like <laughs> rack effects. Oh my gosh! I got no. It. Like, can we do a, a store to a studio tour yet? Oh, the, the original. Yeah, you have the original kidney bean. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember these? I had it. Yeah, I definitely had yep. that hot stuff when it came out in 2002 or something yeah hold on yeah, to that that's, that's gonna my be era that. that's my fucking era. like if you have a midi <laughs> patch control librarian for your hardware then i am the i that was my era wow uh, i'm uh, sorry go on i just i'm so glad that we're having this conversation because it's getting my alarm system ready for this to happen because i really to don't say want no it to, to pod but it's to going kidney. to so, it's happening this is this is really not a popular item you actually could get these for like 20 bucks uh but you know I, no I you just hold on it. to that because yeah that's the <laughs> epitome that will be like because that I, defines the area for everyone sure. will want one of those in like 21 20 years from now yeah they don't and, sound that good <laughs> and, and but at the time it sounded like literally like the like the opposite of tubes like if you want the opposite <laughs> of yeah. tubes plug right your there. guitar into this thing and pull up any amp model <laughs> and and that was that is what you will get you'll get yeah. the the opposite tubes version of that sound i got a weird little anecdote that i feel like uh, given where this conversation is going might be of interest but the um so it, it's a lot about like technique and process and stuff like that so i grew up um i grew up in new york city listening to a ton of electronic music and you know, building electronic music on GarageBand. Like that was really my beginnings of, you know, of composition, like back in 2006, seven or something like that. And uh, so a lot of the music that I was making was sample based music, as in like, I found a melody and something that I like, and then I would take it, splice it, and then like orchestrate the hell out of it. Oh, did you hack GarageBand to like load multiple samples of your audio into their built in sampler? uh yeah well actually you could do that natively in garage band in my day I'm sure oh okay wow yeah you yeah, had yeah, to hack it back in my early days <laughs> you had to make garage a band. sound effects track yes you individually dragged and dropped samples mm -hmm. onto the keys it was not a convenient system but i mean like it did a lot um but anyway so i was like i was composing sample based music that way and this is really weird this wasn't until like two years ago like well into my professional career of doing that um, I watched this little documentary where Fat Boy Slim, you know, you know, you know Fat Norman Boy Slim. Was, yeah, his birth name was Quentin Leo Cook, and he thought that that was too dorky, so he changed it to Norman. <laughs> Norman, yeah, Norman Hotel, you know, Bates Norman Motel, Hotel. Norman, yeah, A very British name. <laughs> but um, I, I really loved his music growing up, and I watched this like little documentary. I did too, uh, yeah. by the way. Big Fat Boy Slim fan here. It's, it's really good stuff. Like I, I, I didn't stuff. even like go out to clubs or anything like that. Like I just <laughs> loved listening to it. It's really detailed. There's a lot. Yeah, of if we're talking about sample based, he is right a there. fucking genius yeah. at yeah. sampling. He's it's a like, sampling genius. Like if you want to, if it, like if you were to ask me, I know. Oh no, you've opened a can of worms. Okay, like, go ahead. <laughs> give me an example of a sampling genius to study. I would recommend Norman Cook. Norman Cook, for sure. I mean, yeah. he's he's. 
he's still out there. He's not making yeah. a lot of new music, but he's still out there. I think I saw um, something of him recently. Yeah. Yeah. He's not Palookaville, I think, was like, oh, that yeah. album killed. Like, yeah. it was so good. It was it the epitome. And he made like it all, it was all on an S1000 with a bunch of like love tone effects. Yeah. Well, I think you're kind of getting to what I was saying. I was, I, so I watched this little like five minute, like behind the music thing. And I was kind of shocked because what I saw instead was not how as a kid, for some reason, I had envisioned Fat Boy Slim working, which was sitting in a DAW, finding the things that he liked and right. putting them together. No, of course not. That's not at all how his process worked. His process worked with a huge freaking MIDI sample station coming out of the computer and then MIDI data being sent like an octopus yes. to a 303 and an 808 and, you know, an Nord lead. Station. Yeah, Nord lead rack. And so, yeah, so, I mean, it was totally different, like re seeing that then all of a sudden realizing, oh, oh, wait, that's how it worked. Fat Boy Slim isn't composing, he's conducting in a weird set. He's sitting down at a computer and then individually firing off things. He's not at all sitting down thinking of a melody he likes and then finding the sample. Right. No, yeah, he's no, not at all. It as a, he's sitting as a as a Atari, actually, right? Like his, right. his Atari computer. But it, it, anyways, it was it was kind of like a, a shock to me, at least, like realizing, oh wait, the way I was thinking this music was made was actually a lot more difficult than how the music was made, or not at all like the no. format that it was built for. And so, like when you realize that, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, there are different recipes I can use, you know? Like that that's that was a really big wake up call to me. And so like. So I try to emphasize a lot of that, like in the tape workshop and simple workshop and stuff like that. Like the way that you will compose with it is different than how you will compose on a piano, right? Like mm -hmm. if you compose on tape, you're probably not thinking melody first, like you would on a piano. And so just learning to like work with your technique in order to make a recipe that works, I think is like, it's a, it's a big important lesson on how you compose. Like I went to I went to fancy conservatory for several years where people yelled at me about the right and wrong ways to compose and how I should feel bad about myself for composing certain ways. Like it's stupid. There's no right or wrong way to compose. <laughs> like, I, exactly. you know, I really want to emphasize that if you're making a sequence of sounds, I don't care what you're doing, you're composing. Right. And so, you know, like, you know, it's, it's so much nicer to think about it that way. Cause then people come up with this dumb classist hierarchy for is a songwriter, a composer, like, yes, obviously. Right. You know? <laughs> And so, um, yeah, so I think when you, um, like, exactly as you say, like, yeah, if you play with an oboe or something like that, like, there are many ways that you can compose with an oboe. It doesn't have to be putting notes on tape. And so, I don't know, I think that, that that's really worth emphasizing, because far too often when people think about composers, they think about very privileged people. Yeah. They're not thinking about <laughs> Halim El Dab. Yeah, exactly. They're not thinking about El Dab. Um, but you know, yeah, what El Dab did is totally composition, and it's not very different from field recording and effects processing. Like, yes, it is that exactly. that is composition, and that is totally valid. So. Well, I love this. I love that you're exposing people to this. Uh, these what are old ideas, but are being kind of repurposed for our new generation of you know digital people, <laughs> whatever we are. It's now. something that we do as well. Like that. we sort of just like you know, interview people or, or bring up topics that like, just sort of lay it on the table. Like, we're just sort of like, here's this person, you know, and they've done all this stuff and they've been doing a lot of the things that might be in the zeitgeist now, like for a long, 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 long time. And it's, it's existed for many, for decades, you know? And, yeah. and so we try to like highlight, mm -hmm. you know, like their lives work. And a lot of these people did not have any formal training. Um, they're very yeah. self-taught, very DIY. So it's amazing always, the yeah. honorary, um, you know, uh, doctorate degrees mm -hmm. and, and things that yeah. these people Most would, of them have that. would have in common that they've earned, you know, just by, you know, existing through a time period and, and being experimental. Yeah. Well, when you were talking about Fatboy Slim, that's what I was thinking about this idea that like he didn't learn that in a conservatory. Not, right. <laughs> right. And so, you know, we like to say, as FC Judd said, tape music is for everyone. And that's, you know, sort of the the equalizing factor is that, you know, we're kind of taking away this classist, elitist, you know, structure of you must go to the school and you must study with this person and you must use these techniques and it's right or wrong. Right. And how about that's not true <laughs> or real? And if that's not you, then there's this other thing you can do with music and sound and experimentation. And it's actually extremely fulfilling and inspiring because, you know, 
sound is one of, you know, the original sources of, you know, what we're made of and, you know, how our universe was created. And to have that connection with it as someone who maybe thinks they're not a musician or they're not a composer is what I love about working with tape and like hacking things and and the DIY approach. So I'm really excited that, you know, you're, you know, out in the West Coast kind of nurturing this, you know, for people as well. And we're all, I mean, it's, okay. it's exciting that there, there are a ton of people doing this work now. And honestly, like a year ago, I don't feel like there was this much enthusiasm for tape. I don't, I don't know where that came from. I feel like no, we were yelling into the void for a while. For can, sure. Sure. I think we can safely longer. say six months ago. Really? There wasn't this when sort of enthusiasm did, for tape, in my opinion. When did that video from Sound of Machines about making that oh, that Rich Mellotron Rich thing? Yeah, Rich oh, and yeah. I talk a lot. Yeah, he's, he's great. Guy. Are you yeah. using the Rich design, by the way? I'm curious. Awesome. Sorry? Are you using his design for the... No. Just no, a coincidence. Just a coincidence. Yeah, yeah okay. we started working with the exact same Walkman, and then he like suddenly he, a video came up saying, I'm about to put a tutorial online for this. And we went, oh, shoot, no, shoot. If we release our workshop now, everyone's going to think we ripped off Rich. So we, we put him out at the same time. And, like, <laughs> Rich and I talked. But yeah, we, we use different designs. There's also this guy uh, named uh, Trevor Rudd, who runs Mock Hunter Mods up in uh, Vancouver, Washington. That oh, cool. also mods Byron Static's cassette decks. It's Hunter just, mods or whatever. Yeah, I've seen those. Hunter mods, yeah. Uh-huh, so yeah. It's really cool. And he uses our CV mod now for getting control voltage. Oh. In. That's what we came up with. But uh, but he's super cool. He's doing a lot of amazing work in this domain as well. And uh, yeah, it's it's really nice. Like, not only are there a lot of people doing this work, but people are just like lovely about it. Like, I, I, I went to a composition department party once when I was an undergrad. And, and everyone was, you know, sitting down, no one was talking, and then someone made a derogatory comment about a 1967 art film, and then there was a fight, and then everybody left. So <laughs> back to any composition department parties, it's so much different, like in the, in the tape world, people are, you know, gregarious, and they're excited to learn from one another. No one gets competitive with other people for stupid reasons, like, no, we're all in this domain together, and we're all just kind of messing around and having a good time, and so it's, it, that's it's that's just such a nice thing about it. I, don't I will yeah, I will that admit well. that you know we sell tape loops on our website. Oh, <laughs> so we're in the game. <laughs> there you go. For um, what it's worth, like we are, we're in the game for some tape loops, yeah. and we've contemplated modding tape machines. Well, people always ask us to do these. They things. want like you that. should have yeah, this, yeah. or you should do this, or can you do this for me? And it's like. Yes, but also you could do it for yourself. I mean, too. my modded cassette machine <laughs> is a Jensen like Walkman that I bought on Amazon for 20 bucks yesterday. You know what I mean? It was it's not one of the typical ones that I see, but it can be done in the very much the same way. Yeah, I love that there's so much open source, you know, yeah. information out there about this. And I I've found the same thing with our Facebook group, you know, it's been consistently so positive. That's great. And I'm shocked because it's like, we're first of all, we're on Facebook. So you're going to expect, right, some weirdness. You're going to expect right. trolling but as, yeah. Something standard. about this group, you know, it is private and people have to like, you know, be accepted into it. But I don't, I don't get like a ton of people. N- no, nobody's like banging down the door to get into the tape group. That's a weirdo. Um, it's mostly just people who are like, so stoked well many weirdos but no this. assholes so. yeah there you go we're all weird I, but that's amazing. look i don't i i totally thought when we thought started this synthesizer workshop we were going to get annoying synth bros yeah you know with too much money and i am so surprised we've gotten pretty much no one like that consistently everyone that signs up for these workshops is just super cool and like yeah. i want to talk with them for long periods of time and they get along with other people and they make cool stuff like I'm I'm amazed. I don't know how we're able to find a consistent group like that every month, but for such that's, an activity. Yeah, that's so cool. I think that just is such a great reminder that like the loudest voices that we hear and this sort of like dominating, like sort of grumpiness is not the majority. It's true. Right. And I'm really happy to hear that. I'm very it's, happy to hear that. Yeah. It's nice to hear that. Building like real community where you're seeing people's faces and you're getting to talk to them, it, it tends to be much more positive than totally. like random Reddit threads and a, stuff like that. A lot that. of what I've heard of. Like you're doing it with people, right? Yeah. It's more fun with people. I think so too. 
I've heard that of, you know, the modular community, you know, you hear, you hear a lot of, you know, if you're on panels or you're on, you know, like the festivals and stuff, like you hear people talk about uh, how the modular community is really positive. And I agree. I mean, it can't, you know, obviously if you're not talking about the Facebook feed, right. It's pretty positive. The actual people that I know and interact with are Are very cool. The people whose faces I don't know tend to not be so great. But I think the tape hackers, like that might even be a little bit even more. more, more it's a wealthier community, I will say that. That's oh, really? Okay. Large, well, the modular synth world, just because yeah. the modular synth world doesn't cost a lot of money. And, you know, uh, like much less than it used to. But I, you know, I that's, see what still, you mean. Yeah. that's still very much like a part of, you know. So like that, 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 that honestly, like that's my biggest issue with the Euro rack world. Like I, I, I literally have a modular right there. And I, mm-hmm. I love modular synthesis. I think it's really cool. I think conceptually it's amazing. Instead of you being the performer and your synth being the instrument, it's kind of like an instrument that plays you like you're kind of the conductor. Yeah, you're part of the circuit. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you don't know what you're going to get out of it. And that's beautiful. Like, I think like a lot of people could get bitten by the musical bug with a good introduction to modular synthesis. That being said, maybe this is just because I'm in the Bay Area surrounded by a lot of tech people. But like there's a lot of like it very quickly, the focus shifts from making music into making products. And really quickly, people just start to collect the mall mentality when it comes to Euro rack stuff. So people start buying a ton of modules that they don't really consider and they don't really, you know. Mm-hmm. So like that, that, that's ultimately where, where it comes down. Like not like if you want to spend your money on modules, that's great. I would rather you spend your money on modules than a lot of other stuff. But that blows uh, yeah. my mind, though, as a concept. But it makes sense, though. <laughs> I get it now that you're saying that because you're in the Bay Area, it is a collectible type of yeah. thing where you do I, come across a lot of people who are like, I have this, I have that. And you're like, what are you doing with it? Well, nothing. I just have them. <laughs> Quick question though, like, do you, do you uh, have a day job? Uh, yeah, Dogbotic is my full time job. Oh, sweet. oh okay. Yeah, so you awesome. you are full time Dogbotic. Cool. I, I, awesome. Full time Dogbot. Uh, <laughs> happened for the last three years. So yeah. And this should have been my first question, but yeah. why the name Dogbotic? Why the name Dogbotic? Oh, well, uh, so I was really worried that uh, there are a lot of like sound house companies that frankly just don't have very interesting names. <laughs> um, yeah. like there, you know, and uh, it tends to be that those are the companies that people get, you know, that people hire for like car commercials or something like that. So I really like, you know, we don't do a ton of work in advertising. Um, most of the projects we do are really just weird art projects or like we're doing a, a PSA for the UN right now, a whole bunch of stuff <laughs> like that. And uh, I felt like having a completely ludicrous, ridiculous name would m- kind of weed out some of the less, uh, you know, some of the, some of the more serious clients, um, you know, so that you, you kind of have to have a sense of humor if you're going to hire dog botic to do your sound design. And that, that's, it's worked out surprisingly well. I'm really lucky that we have, we have the clients we do and we work with people that are just incredibly imaginative and open to weird stuff. And, you know, like it's really fun to work with them. I love that you chose the name for it being for weird. that reason. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's also, you know, it was dorky or whatever. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. nice to have a mascot um yeah i mean yeah, that's can't, easy can't go wrong with dogs i can't <laughs> right yeah i mean the dog aspect is definitely brilliant you yeah. know like oh, that's good uh, of course dog this was our uh like our christmas card from a couple of years ago but we had a bunch of our clients who are all illustrators uh draw their own dog bots and so you can oh wow oh you could put them oh that's so cool you can combine that's elements so cool. oh wow yeah okay yeah now i want that we were, we were into the idea we thought of, you know um and it's also nice that it's not explicitly tied to just music production so um you know so we can do workshops we're doing another workshop coming up that's not even music at all it's all about video synthesis so how to build a circuit that actually makes synthesizes an image from nothing and you know all sorts of stuff like that so um yeah i don't know we'll, we'll see where this goes we're all figuring it out Jacqueline exactly. was just asking we, me about the, just... pro- the progress of my video synthesizer <laughs> today. She was story. like, yeah, what's what's going on with the video synth? I haven't heard you talk about that much. And it's I, tricky, right? I don't have a great answer. <laughs> I'm like, well, I just built a bunch of DIY modules, you know, the cadet series from LZX. Mm-hmm. And they, I haven't really like, I mean, they do stuff. <laughs> and I have like a little recorder that I can record from my laptop, like whatever, you know, is in the RCA jack, you know, like yeah. a little video, basic video recorder. And I'm going to record some like knob turning, some live knob turning sessions. And that's about it for me. Like, you know, like I'm just 
playing around with color on the screen and you know like it's it's fun you know but it's definitely not something i'm an expert at or anything and you know yeah. it's cool that you're doing that as a workshop well it's honestly like you you probably know you probably know the concerns but like uh so sean hallowell who's my colleague who's developing that curriculum uh, like a lot of like what he's had to do is like find this weird French textbook from 1992 and find this one chapter on it and then use the circuit from this. To... So it's like, like the video synth community is even more gatekeepy yes. on the internet than the audio synth community. Like it's people dated, really don't yeah. Want to tell you stuff. Right. Yeah. You know? mm. So we don't understand why. I think the more people that are creative, like for selfish reasons, even as a creative person myself, the more creative other people are, the better a world I live in. Like the, the higher standards I am held to, the more adventurous people are with creative things. So like, I, I, I view it as we as a studio actively benefit from people yeah. having access to these techniques uh, and people being used to these techniques. So that makes awesome. sense. Yeah, it makes awesome. a lot of sense. Video I mean, synth in every house. There we go. <laughs> I love that as a mission. <laughs> there we go. Let's Would we, um, video synth. Could we get a little uh, little tour of your space? Oh boy. <laughs> um, well, sure. So my camera's rooted down right now, but let's see if I can point uh, point out some interesting things. There are literally hundreds of instruments in here, uh, and I'm trying to think of ones that are the coolest to show you, but they're all over. Um, so yeah, immediately to the right, there's a. It's kind of like an analog station here. So I got the computer that I'm broadcasting myself on. When we do work that needs to go onto like quarter inch reel to reel tape, I actually literally can just send it right over into this half of the studio. Okay, uh, gotcha. So yeah, so we, we, we produced an album a couple months ago that was actually, uh, everything was set through an analog intermediary at the end. So it all has this kind of warm, you know, you know, tape overdrive to it. And so, yeah, so that was all done here. So we do that there. What tape machine? Um, it is a Tanberg reel-to-reel -reel from 1959. It was my dad's, uh, and uh, he actually, yeah. So he took he took banjo lessons uh, with Mike Seeger. Who this is a weird story. Mike Seeger's Pete, Pete Seeger's brother. Yeah. Uh, and he gave me so he we I had this uh, tape machine fixed up because it sounds great and it looks super cool. Oh, Tanbergs are yeah. great. Yeah, that's great. They're worth like, fixing up. Too. They're you know they they weren't that hard to fix. Uh, but I have this recording from 1959 of Mike Seeger giving a banjo lesson to my dad that we have the only copy of. So that that that's in our our special. Um, it was that, and also listening to like all of these weird things my dad recorded when he was like a college student, going like, "Oh, that doesn't sound too different than a lot of the stuff I was doing in college." So, I don't know. so that was cool. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. There's a lot of overlap there. Whenever you talk about tape, there's always going to be like a good story. Totally. Yeah, I totally agree. There's um, yeah. And anyway, this entire wall essentially is all stuff that talks to each other normally when it's set up. So there's a whole bunch of modular gear there. Uh, this here is a uh, an FM thingy that was custom made for us by Aisha Lowe of Low Sounds. Uh, they're uh, they're awesome. I think they're one of the very few uh, women owned pedal companies in the country right now but they make amazing stuff and so i'm going to plug them but Thank this is you. a little nice delay module that we use for a whole bunch of stuff you got the mpc there's a mini log i have a whole bunch of circuit bent things i got a vibra slap because at long last yeah like i needed one you know <laughs> uh, but um yeah and uh let's see what else there's there's several organs over there there's an accordion over there there's you know we've got a full string section in here yeah there's a lot of stuff uh, <laughs> Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, you know, it's fun. I, I like that uh, every, every job I get to use something different. So, you know, no, no two projects feel the same. And I can always use a new technique for some of them. Uh, but I mean, yeah, there's, there's so much stuff in here to show you. Uh, I'll show you one thing, though. This one is really cool. So this is, uh, have you seen one of these before? You may or may not have, but uh, it's called a wind wand. It was developed by a guy named Daryl DeVore, who's uh, lived in Marin uh, in the Bay Area. He okay. He was an instrument inventor. It's made out of rubber bands. You can make them with like school kids really easily and you twirl it around and uh, well, I'll turn on original sound. This is what it sounds like. Very didgeridoo. 
It's a really strange sound. You can tune it to depending on how much fetch there is on the rubber band. Say, you can uh, change things there. Yeah, great for uh, sound designing wasps or biplanes. I was going to say, I felt like lightsaber vibes from that as well. It is pretty lightsaber yeah. I might sample that later, even mm -hmm. with the sound mm -hmm. quality that we have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, most, most certainly. You are, you are welcome to. Wow, that is so cool. So like something like that, where you're then like going to tape with that, like, and then messing with Oh, absolutely. With it. That's you're the dream. Tape with that, slow it down to the point where you can no longer recognize it. Like you'll end up with cool stuff really quick. <laughs> I think uh, exactly. That's the great thing about tape. Like, there's um, we see one of these. This is the Library of Congress. C okay, yes, I was right. Yeah, right, okay. you're tape people. Of course, you know what this is, right? So, um, I found this on eBay like several years ago and got it for like sixty bucks. I think it was like right after they became legal to sell. I was gonna say and, you uh, are lucky. <laughs> yeah, before they became like a hot collector's item. But uh, for yeah, for people watching this who don't know, so this was uh, designed by the Library of Congress for uh, the blind or visually impaired. So way back in the day, right, when you wanted to get a periodical, uh, like, and you were blind, right, you had to get an audio recording of it or you got it in Braille. Of course, if you put that on a single cassette, right, a Sunday newspaper is going to take like eight cassettes to fill. <laughs> so Library of Congress instead we built this player that can play stuff back at incredibly slow speeds. So instead of listening to eight cassettes, you listen to one cassette and it's your entire Sunday newspaper. And it has all these weird features. It can do auto reverse to the opposite side and stuff like that. And so... I got this thing and started fiddling around with it with a whole bunch of recordings from my childhood. And the kind of weird like realization I had was um, by toying with the speed that I played it back, recordings that I was very familiar with as a kid suddenly became like totally new pieces of music. And it was that realization that like this machine really emphasizes that playback is subjective, right? Like when you're playing with a digital file, you're only going to get it back at exactly the sampling rate that it, the file was made at. But when you're dealing with tape, really the art that you're buying when you buy a cassette is a waveform. You're not even really buying a, a, a regulation to it. And so like there was this weird moment where I, I, I felt like, wow, wait, hold on. So that meant until digital audio became a thing, every time you listen to a recording, you were going to get it at a slightly different speed. Like, that's a really weird thing to think about. It's like, super weird. <laughs> yeah, kind of subjective idea. is the word. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and that's like, that. you know, that, that that really gives a lot of power to you as the musical consumer. Like, you mm -hmm. can or as the listener, yeah. yeah, yeah like, yeah. you could be like, I choose to listen to this back on my shitty Walkman <laughs> that has a belt that needs to be replaced, and it's going to sound like it could sound really cool x you yeah know? like and that's how i want to listen to it that's how i listen to all my music <laughs> exactly and who's to say you're wrong right like i mean it's not weird because now there are some songs that i loved as a kid that now i prefer at different speeds than were originally intended that just, absolutely yeah. totally makes sense to me yeah i've never done that but it makes sense to me or yeah, intentionally um, you should you should try it. Um, it. It's yeah, it's really fun to take uh, like up tempo songs and turn them into really down tempo slow jams and stuff like that, and just see what comes out. The coolest thing in te te uh, tape technology that I remember from my childhood is that my dad had a tape machine, a tape you know rec player in his like 1990 Grand Marquee. This is before you were born. Oh, <laughs> and it had you know AMS which is the ability to automatically fast forward to the next track. Yes. If you hit AMS, amazing. fast forward. There were so many cool little And things I love that. that. I was like, dude, that is so cool because like I have to actually like think about like how that's possible with, I know. with your tape player. Like, like how does it know when it gets to the next track? <laughs> I have so many questions. You know what I mean? But like with digital, it all goes away. Yeah. You're just like, no, it's a computer. Boring. <laughs> it probably just waits until the voltage goes down to zero and then it presumes there's a gap in between. there's a thing that um i, I guess we, we kind of we, we do allude to it in the cassette hacking workshop because a lot of it is thinking about you know analog technology but a thing that really like uh like kind of freaks me out about like the digital revolution is um so you've heard of the uh you, you, you've heard of the, the 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 golden record, right? On Voyager. Yes, yes of, course. of so, course. Yeah, we we love that story. It's our favorite. Space. It was a beautiful art prompt of like the greatest works of music known to humankind being sent out. And so someday, millions of years in the future, some alien civilization can find the record and intuit, oh, this is sound. And then they, they'll, <laughs> they'll figure out how to make a player for it. it. Like they'll get it. <laughs> that's, that's the weird thing is I could totally see like 
if a, if a reasonably advanced civilization finds a record, they could probably put two and two together and be able to extrapolate the data from the record. <laughs> that seems to be possible, implausible, but possible. What's thoroughly impossible, though, is if you gave them a flash drive, like okay, you're just you wanted to get, my mind. I yeah, never thought about this. <laughs> punch card read for your Univac <laughs> computer. Who would you go to? You, 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 you can't go to anyone, right? The fact right. that you put stuff on flash drives now, and yet you know that in 50 years, USB sockets are going to look different. So you're probably going to have to do a lot of work to find a USB B reader, right? You know, <laughs> it all kind of points to this really scary, but kind of inevitable truth to me, at least that's, uh, you know, we are right now living in the middle of a dark ages that we're just not calling a dark ages yet. Yeah, you know, it's a, I don't know, it's just the thing that kind of worries me, like to think that we are, you know, I have so many photos from this era in my life, and how easy is it going to be for me to actually get those photos in 50 years? That's the thing that keeps me up at night. Well, it is also the thing that's like created new industries of uh, people who have media from the past who need to convert it and put it on a DVD or whatever, sure, you know, that's like a thing. that's a yeah. whole industry. <laughs> that's ironic. Cause it's going the other way. It is, exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. For preservation, keep it in zeros and ones. Yeah. Good yeah. luck trying to build a, a an MP3 codec. In yeah. Right. Like, Oh, wow. Well, this has gone to some really amazing places, this conversation, and I'm so glad you were down for that. Um, really, really glad that you were able to join us here today for our experiment in interviews for our podcast. And thank you for showing us all your cool stuff. Well, why don't you tell us about the workshop and how people can sign up for it and anything else you have going on? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, thanks. So, um, yeah. So dogbotic.com slash labs, or you can find it on the website. It's not a very big website. So yeah, we got two workshops currently and we're releasing a ton more like in a few weeks, but one of them is the cassette one. Our final one is in June. We have a couple okay. spots left. So uh, we're going to then retire it and I, hopefully we'll bring it back. But, you know, we'll, we'll why are you retiring it kits wise? Uh, well, we're, we're retiring it because we want to go out on a high note. And so, you know, it seems like a I I, it, I I am impressed that so many people are just so down to work with tape. Like yeah. so it, it has been really cool. But you know, um, yeah, well, we're gonna take a break for a few months. We'll see how it is. Maybe we'll bring it back. It's a lot of fun for us to do. So there's that. We also do the DIY synthesizers workshop. We have uh I have sessions starting in June. I'm teaching all of those. So that's unlike cassette hacking. That one is nine weeks long. We work on a project that you invent and you get a lot of face time with me, just troubleshooting and stuff like that, but you learn how to make oscillators, filters things that react to wow. light, sequencers, weird stuff, you'd be into it. Uh, and we're also, so we have two other courses that you are- You do low-pass gates? Yeah, we do. We do. Oh, wow. So uh, yeah, I would be into that. not that hard to make, believe it or <laughs> right, not. Right, uh, right, right. Yeah. But make synth heads get all excited. It does. <laughs> so yeah, this summer we're also doing a thing for teenagers. Uh, so people aged 13 through 17, we're calling it Electro Camp. Effectively, it's a- uh, so it's like a month long, you meet once a week, and it's all about essentially foraging for new sounds. So we give you a kit with a ton of stuff in it. Everything in the kit effectively is like a new pair of ears. So you chain it on with alligator clips to an amplifier, and we'll give you things that can listen to light, that can listen to the digital signals coming out of your remote controls. We do an activity where we give everyone a stethoscope, and we tell you how to rewire it so you can record your heartbeat and then make beats out of it. Uh, it's a lot of weird stuff. Uh, That's so Thing that can listen to uh, meteorites self-immolating in the atmosphere above your head. Fancy what? stuff. So yeah, all of that. It's for ages 13 through 17, no experience required. We want to have, you know, teenagers make cool music with sounds they've never heard. We have video synthesis and then, gosh, I'm sorry, these are a lot of plugs. And then we're, we're also doing another workshop that we're launching, I think, in later summer. And this one's a really weird one. It's called ear retraining. So the idea behind it is it's a it's a workshop that ultimately like we, we want to change the way that you listen to music. So it's thinking about music through a media theory lens. So you we build a record player together. We build a radio that you can use to listen to shortwave communications from the other side of the world. We build a digital sampler out of a greeting card by rewiring it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really a, a workshop that's all about thinking about form and how we build our content based on form, which I know is not as sellable as like <laughs> circuit bend a Walkman, 
because <laughs> it sounds very academic, but it actually is going to be really cool. So I'm teaching that along with uh, Nick Dunstan, who is a bassist and avant-garde composer who's currently based in Berlin. Well, thank you so much again for, you know, making the time to talk with us. Thank you. And, you know, sharing our tape enthusiasm. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll be sure to, you know, put some links in the show notes for everybody to find you on all the places, the websites and the socials and everything. So thank you so, so much for joining us. And um, yeah, we'll be uh, excited to check out more of what you're doing.